Broadcasting Network. I stood and watched an eagle fly, spread his wings and soared across the sky. So gracefully he flew. Welcome to Reaching Higher. Hi, I'm Rick Godwin, and I'm with Eagle's Nest Christian Fellowship down in San Antonio, Texas. We appreciate you tuning in for the next 30 minutes, and I trust what we're about to say will bring great encouragement to your heart as a believer. We're here in Dallas, Texas today shooting this program right in front of the new studio of Trinity Broadcasting Network, right here in the mid-cities, very near the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. I'm glad you're with us. It's hot and steamy. I feel like jumping in this pool and cooling off a little bit, but I'm not preaching on baptism, so I can't. I want to preach today on the subject, bridal preparation by the Holy Spirit. Bridal preparation by the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 22, verse 17, John writes, The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. I want to look at the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the bride of Jesus Christ, which is the church. The Bible in the book of Genesis opens with a perfect bride. And the Bible in the book of Revelation closes with a perfected bride. And that's all before the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to quote from John 14. Because here, Jesus is explaining to the disciples his soon departure. The disciples feel that they're going to be left as orphans, hopeless, lonely, with no comfort. But Jesus is explaining that will not be the case. He says in John 14, verse 16, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So Jesus said, that's not true. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you another comforter. Now, question, why does Jesus say another comforter? Simply because he, as a person, was going back to heaven. And as a result, another comforter would come in his place, the Holy Spirit. And he would come alongside to help these disciples. The word comforter in the Greek is uh, paraclete. It means advocate. It means lawyer attorney, one called alongside to help to plead your case, to help you victoriously in your trial. Now, our English word for advocate is attorney. Do you remember in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My little children, I write unto you that you sin not, but if a believer sin, we have an advocate with the Father in Jesus Christ the righteous. So, an advocate is the same word for comforter. It's the same word attorney. As Christians, we have two advocates today. I have Jesus Christ in heaven. Jesus is not on the earth. He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for you. And on earth, we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to represent us and to help us and to plead our case. See, there's a kind of battle for our inheritance going on right now. Jesus died, and by his death and resurrection, he made a new testament, a new will, and testament, a new covenant. But in order to assure us that we get all that's ours through his resurrection in this new covenant, he sent us, if you will, heaven's best lawyer, the Holy Spirit. Not F. Lee Bailey, not Racehorse Haynes, the Holy Spirit, to make sure we get all that's ours and to make sure the crooked lawyer, the devil, the cheat, the deceiver, doesn't rob us of what is our rightful inheritance. So Jesus tells the disciples, another comforter's coming who will never leave you. He will be with you forever. In verse 25 and verse 26, he said, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus said, My teaching job's not complete. I've only been with you three years. You're not able to receive everything. 
But when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He'll do two things. Number one, he'll teach you everything I haven't taught you. And number two, he'll bring everything to your remembrance that I have taught you. So the Holy Spirit not only is my advocate, my attorney, my comforter, he's my teacher, able to cause me to remember. Now, in John 16, verse 7, let me read a verse. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Then in verse 13, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father have are mine. Therefore said I that the Holy Spirit shall take of what's mine and shall show it unto you. I hope you see this. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus in his glory and fullness, and then he takes the inheritance of Jesus, which is rightfully ours, and administrates it to us. So if I'm going to receive my inheritance that Jesus gave me, then I've got to receive it through God's appointed administrator. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. And the essence of what I'm saying is very, very practical. If you're a child of God, then you're an heir of God, a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. But to make sure you receive all of your inheritance, that you're not cheated out of it, Jesus sent you heaven's best attorney to represent you, the Holy Spirit. And he's not merely the interpreter, he's the administrator of everything that Jesus and the Father has. And everything the Father has and everything the Son has are in the hand of the Holy Spirit and come to you by the Holy Spirit. And that's why so many Christians live like orphans instead of kings. See, if you don't get to know the Holy Spirit, if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, if you don't give him rightful place in your life, you, although you're a king and a priest unto God, you'll live like an orphan because you don't know the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Why are so many of God's people in such terrible, desperate needs, sick, afflicted, demon-tormented. Why? Because they've never made friends with their lawyer, the Holy Spirit. So, if you want to live like a king, if you want all of your inheritance that's yours, then get friendly with the Holy Spirit. See the bottom line? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says, Eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for him that love him but he has revealed them to us by his Holy Spirit. See, everything we need has already been made available to us by the grace of God, but we don't know it until the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. And uh, the Holy Spirit says, Rick, yes, that's yours. That's yours. Oh, but I'm not worthy. Oh, but I couldn't do that. Oh, but that's too good. It's yours. And if you don't get friendly with the Holy Spirit, you won't get it. One of your inheritance benefits is healing and health. You've got salvation, why don't you get healing and health? Deliverance and forgiveness. It's all part of your inheritance, but the only way you get it is through the Holy Spirit. Well, no, not me, thank you. I'm going to just talk to Jesus. Sorry, you've got to get acquainted with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in heaven, and you don't even commune with him except through the Holy Spirit. You don't get anything Jesus has except through the Holy Spirit. Some people say, well, you talk too much about the Holy Spirit. You ought to just talk about Jesus, okay? The only one who can reveal Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Friends, you can't escape it. You can't go around it. You have got to come and become friendly with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me show you an Old Testament story to illustrate this truth of the Holy Spirit. It's found in Genesis chapter 24, and it's the story of Abraham sending his eldest servant to get a bride for his only son, Isaac. It's a beautiful parallel here. It has a beautiful allegory. Four main persons in the story. Abraham's a type of God the Father. Isaac, he's the Old Testament only begotten son of Abraham. And he represents Jesus, as Abraham represents God the Father. And we have the bride represented by Rebecca, a picture of the church, who's chosen, who's prepared, and who's willing. But notice the main character in this story doesn't have a name. He's simply called the servant and he represents the Holy Spirit. You see the modesty of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's the author of Scripture. He presents the Father. He presents the Son. 
He presents the bride all by name, but all he calls himself all the way through is the servant, the servant. So as I read Genesis 24 in this story, notice the activity of the Holy Spirit as the administrator of our inheritance. So I hear the fire truck, and you hear me. Genesis 24, verse 2. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray you, your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the God of earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but you shall go to my country, to my kindred, and take a wife for my son Isaac. Now notice the beautiful story here. The servant administrated the entire wealth of Abraham and the son Isaac. That's true of the Holy Spirit. All the wealth of the Father and all the wealth of the Son is ruled over by the Holy Spirit. And unless you come to the Holy Spirit, you won't get any. Verse 10, the servant comes and took 10 camel of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. So notice the servant comes with 10 camels and each of the camels are laden with gifts. And there's a prophetic significance about the number 10. Verse 11, it says, He made his camels to kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, even the time that women to go out to draw water. Now notice what time the Holy Spirit came to get the bride. He was coming at evening time, the close of the day, the end of the age. See it? And the women were drawing water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee show me good speed today. I'm standing here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come to draw. Let it be, I pray, that the little maiden to whom I say, give me a drink from your pitcher, who gives me a drink, she will say, let me give drink to your camels also. Let that be the one you've appointed for Isaac. Now this is beautiful. When the Holy Spirit found the bride, she was at the well drawing water. We have a lot of people today who say, oh, the church is going to get weak and weak and weak. Antichrist is going to get stronger and stronger. Oh, help me, Jesus, I'll fly away. But the bride was at the well, and the well drawing water speaks of salvation, speaks of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, with joy shall you draw waters from the wells of salvation. That means the church at the close of the day has got enough water, enough salvation, enough power of God to win a host of the world's inhabitants right up to the end, drawing water, winning men and women to Jesus in power, in great glory. I like that. And every patriarch got his wife at a well drawing water. Boy, there's a beautiful study there. But notice that the Holy Spirit, or the servant, chooses a specific sign to identify the bride. He said, I want more than a drink of water. All the women will give you a drink of water. That's the social custom. But I want this girl to water my 10 camels too. That's not the social custom. So this girl had to be willing and responsive and have a generous spirit who would water 10 camels. And then it says in verse 17, and the servant ran to meet Rebecca and said, let me drink a little water from your pitcher. She said, drink my Lord, and she hastened. Notice she's not slothful, she hurried. And she let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him to drink. And when she had done giving him to drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also to their finished drinking. And she hastened and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water for all of his camels. Now, I don't know, you just read that and say, oh, how nice. A camel could drink 40 gallons of water. That's 10 camels, that's 400 gallons of water. This is a little girl, and that's gonna be tough. I think that symbolizes faith plus works. It's a beautiful picture of someone who's sacrificial, generous in spirit and willing, not afraid of hard times, not afraid to let her mascara run. She is a woman, is a type of the church in the feminine gender. Now, I think it's important we notice that she's willing, responsive, and generous. And notice that this is hot, hard work. But she doesn't fly away. She doesn't shirk her responsibility. She says, I'll give you drink, and I'll water you 10 camels, and it says she hastened to do it. No sweat. I'll sacrifice. Boy, that's the servant of Jesus, you see? Now, in verse 22, notice something. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, 
that the man took a golden earring, and I'm, King James says golden earring, but it's a stone for your forehead. It isn't an earring. It's a stone for the forehead in gold and two bracelets for her hands of 10 shekels weight of gold. Notice when Rebecca uh, qualified here, she had drawn the water and uh, as soon as she qualified as the bride to the servant, she was immediately marked out with gifts. That marked her out as special and different. And something on her forehead glowed, this beautiful stone. And her arms were singled out by the beautiful bracelets. So I see it as a type of Rebecca being sealed in her forehead by the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 22, verse 4, it says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forehead. I don't believe that's literal. I believe that's spiritual. Her mind had been opened by the Holy Spirit. She had the mind of Christ. She's ready to receive revelation. And her hands with the golden bracelets are set apart to do the will of God. Then in verse 23, the servant says, Do you have room in your house? I've got to spend the night somewhere. She responds in verse 25, I've got straw and food enough and room to lodge in for you and the whole ten camels. Now look in verse 31. And Laban said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared my house and room for thy camels. <laughs> this is beautiful. Not merely had Rebecca drawn the water for the servant. Not only had she drawn water for ten camels, but now she's made room in her house for the servant and ten camels. And I believe this corresponds to receiving the baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit. She had made room in her house and opened up her whole dwelling to the servant. We in the New Covenant are the house of God, the dwelling place of God, the church, the individual believer, the church as a corporate gathering of his believers. And the whole ten camels and the servant come in. And I want you to know ten camels take up a lot of room. Things that hinder have to go, like fear of man, unbelief, tradition and inconvenience and could I say this that those ten camels that caused Rebecca so much trouble ten speaks of testing those camels are the very instruments that God used to take her to Isaac and please know that what the Holy Spirit brings into your life and allows that cause such difficulty sometimes embarrassment are the very things that will bring you to Isaac or to Jesus that's beautiful some people get acquainted with the Holy Spirit at the well, but they never invite them into their house, their body, in the baptism. And notice that uh, when, when the servant said in verse 55, let the damsel uh, go, uh, the brother and sister and mother said, let the maiden abide with us a few days, at least ten. Then she shall go. And the servant said, hinder me not. Now that means that when the servant speaks, you go. When the Holy Spirit calls you, you go, right then. And notice who hindered her. Those closest to Rebecca were the ones who hindered her from following the Holy Spirit. You better look out. You'll get into trouble. You'll get into error. You might get a demon. Ever heard that? Those that you love, those that are closest to you, are the ones who hinder you the most. But notice the servant said, hinder me not. The New Testament says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Resist not the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Holy Spirit insult not the Holy Spirit. See? And so Rebecca is hindered. They said 10 days. That's the number of testing. And notice in verse 53, when Rebecca received the stranger, not only was she blessed, but the whole family was blessed because the servant gave gifts and treasures to her brother and to her mother. How beautiful raiment and precious things. When you open up to the Holy Spirit and you're blessed, those around you get blessed too. Then in verse 58, the servant explains why he's come. It says, And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? She said, I will go. See, when the Holy Spirit says, Will you come now? You've got to say yes now. Where you lead me, I will follow. And notice everything in the kingdom of God is free will. He doesn't make you. It's whosoever will may come. And the Holy Spirit says, Come, follow me. He's going to take us to Jesus. In verse 60, there's a blessing given to Rebekah. It says, They blessed Rebekah and said, be, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let your seed possess the gate of them which hate thee. That's the same blessing given to Isaac. So the same blessing given to Jesus is the same blessing given to the bride. And by this decision to go, Rebekah became a picture and pattern of the church that was to become so fruitful, 
that thousands of millions would come into the kingdom of God. And when that church went out against the Lord's enemies, the gates of hell would not be able to prevail against it. Hallelujah, Rebecca, the church was to be fruitful and to possess the gates of her enemy. I like that. And her seed, we're told in Galatians 3:16, was Christ Jesus, and whosoever is in Christ is the seed of Abraham, the church. Now, all of this blessing was discerned by one thing, Rebecca's response to the servant. And the whole destiny of the church is determined by its response to the Holy Spirit. You as a believer will enjoy God's destiny for your life, God's inheritance for your life solely by one thing, by the measure of your response to the Holy Spirit. So we've got to open up to the Holy Spirit, recognize the Holy Spirit, expose our whole personality to Him and say, come into my house, my life, my church, Holy Spirit, and take over and bring in all your camels. And when those camels come in, don't forget they're all laden with beautiful gifts. Now let's see if we can summarize our story before we go off the air. Notice Rebecca's response to the servant determined her destiny. And the servant came with camels, which are tests. She drew water for the servant. She drew water for the camel. She wasn't lazy. She was willing to sacrifice. That's a mark of the bride, not just she came to church. And notice the servant's gifts marked Rebecca out as the chosen bride. It's the gifts of the Spirit visibly marking out the church as the bride. Also, the fact she's a virgin or pure. Why do you think there's such an emphasis on purity and holiness in God today? God isn't going to take for his bride a harlot. And Rebecca made room for the servant in camels, meaning her convenience didn't come first. If you're going to obey God, if you're going to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you it will be inconvenient. And if you're not willing to be inconvenienced, you're not going to be in the bride. You may go to heaven, but you're not going to be in the bride. And by receiving the servant, Rebecca brought blessing to her entire family, and everybody in the family got blessed. And when you yield to the Holy Spirit, everybody around you gets some sort of blessing. And the servant was Rebecca's only source of knowledge of the Father and of the Son and of her inheritance. She never saw with her fleshly eyes the Isaac she was going to marry. So the servant was the revelator, the one to reveal. Now, how does the church know what the Father's like? How do we know what the Son Jesus is like? We've never seen him, not with our eyes. How do we know what our inheritance is? We know by the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says of Christ, whom having not seen, yet we love. See, we know all about him because the Holy Spirit is revealing him to us. And remember, Rebecca didn't have a map. She had a guide to lead her. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Holy Spirit are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit wrote this Bible. And if we choose to respond to him as he speaks to us, we're being led by the Spirit and we'll fulfill God's destiny for our lives. And finally, Rebecca went to meet the bridegroom wearing his gifts. And could I say in kindness, a church that rejects the gifts of the bridegroom will never be part of the bride. I didn't say you won't be saved and go to heaven. You will. You won't be part of the bride. Can you imagine your espouse refusing the lover's gifts? Not a chance. And the church that says to Jesus, I love you, but I don't want your gifts, will never be a part of the bride. Rebecca said, I will. Now the Holy Spirit speaks today, and he's speaking to you. Jesus said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. He says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Now, today, is the accepted time of salvation. God wants you saved. The Holy Spirit is wooing you to come to Jesus, to give your heart to him. And the Holy Spirit is revealing to you that Jesus loves you, that he died for you, that he will save you, that he will forgive you that he will set you free from the power of Satan, that he will cleanse you of every sin of the past, that he will break the power of sin in your life. The Holy Spirit tells you that and says, Come, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he beckons you today, today. He's calling you, calling you. Will you be like Rebecca? She hastened. She said, I will. Hurry, pick up that phone. 
Call a counselor. Give your life to Jesus. Say, yes, I want to be saved. And for the believer, you said, yes, I want to be saved. You've met the servant at the well of salvation, but have you invited him home in the baptism? Have you been afraid of the baptism and the Holy Spirit? Have you been afraid of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Have you been afraid of the supernatural? You cannot be ashamed of him and please God. And I tell you, as a pastor of a church, as a believer, I have to make an individual decision, decision to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon me in power, to baptize me in the anointing and power of God by the Spirit from on high. But may I say, as a leader, you have to invite the Holy Spirit into your church as well. And when you do, there will be tests, there will be trouble, and there will be inconvenience because everybody doesn't want to get friendly with the Holy Spirit. But don't forget, He is our administrator of our inheritance. He's our lawyer. He's our comforter. And you get nothing that Jesus has. You get nothing that the Father has except by and through the Holy Spirit. So get friendly with the Holy Spirit. He won't hurt you. He won't make you do anything. It's I will. Rebecca said, I will. Maybe the Holy Spirit's calling somebody watching today to the ministry, and it may mean leaving a secular job. Will you? Rebecca said, I will. Are you willing to lay down your denominational papers if they're snatched from you to receive the Holy Spirit and all ten camels? Please remember this. While there's inconvenience and some pain, there are also beautiful treasures, blessings, and gifts as the presence of the Holy One, the Holy Spirit, comes in you and upon you to bless you and those around you. May the Lord give you courage to accept Christ today and to invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Our title and topic today, Bridal Preparation by the Holy Spirit. I tell you, God said, I'm going to have a glorious church, a beautiful bride without spot or wrinkle before I come back. You believe it. Let's believe for it, and let's prepare ourselves. Let's reach higher. God bless you in Jesus' name. I stood and watched.